This episode is about how the uncreated light is a part of a Christian religion. A Christian religion that possibly has the claim to being the first Christian religion. I'll get to that at the end. In this religion, the uncreated light of God is considered God, not a creature. Remember the distinction between the uh, ultimate ground of existence and a creature, which is an image on the screen, kind of. So this tradition says that the uncreated light is God. Now, uncreated means never created, basically eternal. If I make a table, I created it today or yesterday, whenever. But if something is uncreated, but it exists, it's eternal. Now, there's going to be a bit of historical background. And we're going to talk about when Rome moved to Constantinople, something called the Flaoke phrase. I might be mispronouncing that. The Great Schism of 1054, Hesychasm, St. Gregory Palamas, and we'll get to uncreated light. So let's begin with some history. Rome moves to Constantinople. Constantinople is today called Istanbul. So in 324, Rome decided to move its capital to what is today Istanbul. It was named Constantinople after Constantine, after the emperor who decided to do it. The city used to be called Byzantium, and that's, I guess, where we get the phrase, the Byzantine Empire. But the Byzantine Empire is the Roman Empire, as we'll see. So there we go. Constantine claimed Constantinople as the new capital of the empire. That's kind of shocking. That would be as if the United States decided to move its capital from Washington, D.C. to, um, let's say, California, because uh, the weather is better there or something like that. So the empire, the seat of the empire, moved east from Rome to Constantinople. Now, why did they do that? Well, you'll notice here trade. You see, if you're moving goods from east to west or west to east, that is a natural place to cross rather than sailing over this sea. And I remember reading that Constantinople is kind of a natural fortress. It, it, it's easily defended. It didn't take too much work to, to make it a very well defended position. It's a strategic position. It controls trade. And the Romans decided to move their capital there. By about 500 AD, the Western Empire had fallen. And sometimes we hear that, that the Roman Empire fell in whatever, four or 500 AD. Well, the West did. The Eastern Empire was just fine. Here we have the barbarians or the tribes had taken over the West. And there's a sad story. There was a man named Bothius who was a philosopher. He had studied the philosophy of the Greeks of Plato or whatever. And somehow he offended a barbarian king and was condemned to death. And in his cell before his execution, he wrote this book in the form of a conversation. He personified philosophy as a woman and had a conversation with her and looked for uh, strength and courage in the face of his coming execution. This book I read was very popular in Western Europe in the in Middle Ages. I've read part of it. I liked it. I don't think I ever finished it, though. Okay, so Rome, Rome fell, really, in 1453 when Constantinople fell. That case can be easily made. The Roman Empire moved to Constantinople, and it didn't fall until 1453. Now, what does this all have to do with uncreated light? Well, we're getting there. It's just some historical background. The next thing I want to mention is the Filioque phrase. And I'm probably mispronouncing that Latin, but that's why I say it. Now, in a Catholic school, I think the Apostle Creed was a little more known. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But there was also the Nicene Creed, which went back to, I believe, the 300s. And there's something here in bold that we'll see in the next slide. Okay, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Filioque is Latin for and the Son. 
uh, that was not in the original creed. Then the son in the sixth century, I believe I read once that it's kind of started in Spain, but it started to be added to the creed in the Latin churches in the Western Christianity. And it was incorporated in the liturgical practice of Rome in 1014. So it had reached the top of the West. Rome had accepted it. The East did not. They had a problem with it. It wasn't in the original creed. What gave anyone the right to change the original creed that went back to three uh, hundreds? So there was a schism. Well, we'll get to the schism in a minute. But so in the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, whereas in Catholicism, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And here it is here again. The Father somehow generates the Son and the Holy Spirit without the help of the Son. We're here in the Latin Church. Uh, the Father and Son cooperate to generate the Holy Spirit. Okay, so here we go. Okay, the Great Schism. Well, the uh, Eastern Church didn't like it. Said you can't add that phrase. So. We, we don't accept the phrase. So, after the schism, there was the Orthodox Church in the East and the Catholic Church in the West. And the Patriarch and the Pope excommunicated each other, which wasn't very Christian, over this disagreement of doctrine. They excommunicated each other, which meant that if you take this stuff seriously, uh, they had no hope of entering heaven. Doesn't seem to be very Christian. Now, I had said that this church arguably has the claim to being the oldest church. A lot of Catholics would say that the Catholic Church is the oldest church, that Jesus gave authority to St. Peter. Uh, by tradition, St. Peter died in Rome, and therefore the Pope is the successor of St. Peter. Well, that's one story. However, I believe I read that the Nicene Creed, the Pope at the Council of Nicaea, I believe the Pope didn't attend. And of course, the New Testament is written in Greek, not Latin. And the Greeks are uh, adhering to the original creed without this uh, wild and crazy edition of and the sun. I believe the case could be made that they're the original religion established by Jesus, but maybe not. I'm sure it'd be a controversial claim. At any rate, in Eastern Orthodoxy, we have a tradition of what's called hesychasm. And I might be pronouncing that wrong too, I apologize. I read this stuff, I don't hear it very often. Okay, what is that? That is a tradition of monks. Well, here, by the way, is the book where I first read about this. And it seems to be the same book here with a different cover. This is the Amazon cover, and this is the book that I have. And the monks talk about uncreated light as being God, not a creature created by God, but God. And they believe they have experience of it. And I mean direct experience. So as I mentioned before, as you put your finger in a light socket, that kind of experience. And here is St. Simon, the new theologian, who we've seen before. And I'm going to show you some quotes about him. But just to jump ahead, this theology of monks are thinking they can experience God as uncreated light was challenged. And the defender of that dogma was St. Gregory Plamas. And he ended up succeeding. And uh, we'll see more about him in a minute. And therefore, the doctrine of uncreated light is part of Eastern Orthodoxy. So uh, this emphasizes that they're talking about experiential knowledge of God, more like when you put your finger in a light socket, not intellectual knowledge. I could, you know, two plus two is four is a thought, or I could tell you about someone to give you a good description of a person I know. But when you meet the person, that's different. Then you have experiential knowledge of that person. Now, St. Simon, the new theologian, we've seen this before in a previous clip, God is light, non-composite. We've talked about composite entities. This is non-composite, pure and simple divine light. God is light, the highest light. There are those who have not seen this light, have not seen God, for God is light. And here he emphasizes the experiential part of it. If a man is not prepared for this, is like a man whose entrails have been set on fire and over the bear to scorching flame. It's a very intense experience from what they say. Okay, St. Gregory Palamas, we mentioned him before. There was a controversy. 
was this really the uncreated light of God? It's also called the uncreated energies of God. And here we go. Uh, he was a monk of uh, Mount Athos, which is a monastic peninsula in Greece. Interesting place. I believe no women are allowed there. It's all just, just monks. It's a peninsula in Greece. And uh, National Geographic did a piece on it a long time ago. Interesting place. Uh, he defended the Hesychast spirituality. He said, yes, they are experiencing the uncreated light of God. Now, they identify that light with the light that should. There's an incident in the New Testament when Jesus is transfigured on Mount Tabor. And sometimes they call that Taborite light. And, but they emphasize that it is God. It's not a creature that God made. And I didn't hear something I didn't know until I found it uh, in this research. Uh, St. Gregory Plamas was repeatedly cited as a great theological writer by Pope John Paul II. I didn't know that. Okay. Now we're going to see what people of the Orthodox Church say today about this uncreated light. We're going to watch two clips. Here's one clip. There's the link if you want to go there. We're going to watch that clip. Miracles of the Uncreated Light The Holy Spirit found in Orthodoxy In the tomb of our Lord Jesus Christ, the uncreated light, the holy fire, the holy light comes every single Easter on his resurrection. We also find it in baptism, the Holy Eucharist, and more. And here is a second clip. Here is a um, priest of the Eastern Orthodox Church talking about the uncreated light. Light, the uncreated light is a manifestation of these energies. So we, you know, we have all these light in the halos, right? This is actually meant to represent this uncreated energy of God that I told you about that infuses a human person. Just like real electricity. You're infused with it, and you shine. And actually, they visibly shine. Uh, well, visibly is a bad use of the word. But anyway, this is what happens on the, at the Transfiguration, right? The glory of Christ, which is, is, the un, is the glory of his divinity, shines out. It's his uncreated energies. And that's what this light is. And by communing with these energies, this is one main form in which a person experiences God in light. That light is just one manifestation of the energies of God. God's goodness is another manifestation. His mercy, His love. Um, but the light actually, within our Orthodox tradition, actually appears visibly. So it's, it's a sort of a further confirmation. Though oftentimes the saints, when they experience the light, they're not even sure that they're experiencing it. It's only when they stop experiencing it that they're like, wait, why is it so dark? Uh, there's a wonderful story of Elder Pisces, St. Pisces now, of the Holy Mountain, who... Uh, you know, he was in his, doing his prayer roll and, you know, whatever, and he had this ecstatic experience uh, of, of the uncreated light. Uh, and when he came out, you know, everything was dark, and he was saying, what's going on? Like, it's, it's, it's almost noon, and it's still pitch black out. And the monk, the, you know, he said it to him, was like, Father, what are you talking about? It's as bright as anything, you know, but... It's because the light of, of the radiance of God is so bright. Other saints will talk about as seeing, seeing two lights. The light of the sun and this other light. How is it possible to see two lights? Can you distinguish the light from this lamp from the light from that lamp? Anyone? Like, what does that even mean? But if you experience it, it makes sense. And, and the interesting thing is when, when saints who have had the experience of God get together and start talking about what that experience is like, they know exactly what they're talking about. And they know what they mean. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's a great way to describe it. Whereas the rest of us sitting there be like, two lights? One of the sun and one of something? And they're different at the same time as they're both shot? You know, that kind of thing. Now, the last point I want to make is Christianity composes about a third of the human race, uh, the Christian religion. And... Had not the great schism occurred, and had the doctrine of uncreated light been accepted by the West, by Catholicism, 
And had the Protestant Reformation also accepted that dogma, that it would be possible that today the doctrine of God as uncreated light would be a standard part of Christianity. Of course, it didn't go that way, but I think it could have. It's something to think about. Now, in our theology, the uncreated light, the ultimate ground of existence is God. And a God who is a person like Jesus or Krishna or whoever is uh, a creature. Something, if, if they exist at all, they're a creature because there's only one God, the ultimate ground of existence, the uncreated light. But of course, in Eastern Orthodoxy, they turn that around. This is the light of God, and they might say the light of Jesus. I mean, they, they have a different view. So I'm not saying that Eastern Orthodoxy supports our theology, but I'm saying that this idea of uncreated light and mystical experience of uncreated light occurs in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Thank you.